Our first reader this evening is going to be Emily Wheeler. I'm going to read her lengthy bio as fast as I can. <laughs> Emily wrote the lead story for the spring 2013 edition of Pioneer Magazine, Growing Up the excuse me, Growing the Kingdom, Mormon Pioneer Gardens. Her personal essay, Imperfect Instruments, won the 2014 Prose Award from the Segula Magazine and was published in 2015. Her first novel, The Haunting of Spring at Hall, came out in 2015 and won the Gold Quill Award from the League of Utah Writers. In 2016, two of her award-winning essays are scheduled to be published, Barn Raising in the Utah Historical Quarterly, and screen time in the League of Utah Writers annual anthology. Cedar Ford will be publishing two of her books of uh, historical fiction, Born to Treason, and No Peace with the Dawn, which she co-authored with Jack Bateman, who is also here tonight, Emily. If anybody didn't get a chance to sign up, this is going to be in the back of the room, so sign up. Um, this piece is called Inspiration. Um, it's a short story and it was my attempt to um, sort of capture a glimpse of the writer in his or her natural state, which is of course procrastination. There's a knock at the door. That's where I'm stuck. My protagonist is standing over her boyfriend's corpse, the murder weapon in hand, and she hears a knock at the door. It could be the police. Nah, no good. If they knew about the murder, they'd break down the door, and if not, why would they be there? Her best friend? Friends help you move, but real friends help you move bodies, right? That's a bit cliche. So is the knock on the door, though. The, um, the cat hops up and sniffs my screen, then steps on the keyboard, contributing. <laughs> <laughs> we used that line last time. I drop the cat on the floor, hit backspace a dozen times, and lean my swivel chair way back. My hair and arms dangle over the edge as I spin and stare at the patterns on the textured ceiling. I spot a horse, a dancing couple, and a dolphin with a creepy mustache. No inspiration there. My ever-patient husband took the kids out, giving me the whole day to myself. You have to have fun, he said. Get some work done on your book. Crap. Three hours until they come home. So far, I haven't had fun or written a word. I clean the bathroom, even reorganize the toilet paper, soap, and feminine hygiene products under the counter. Then, I overthrew a new civilization forming in the back of the fridge. It may once have been lasagna. If I can just get past this scene, I'll call the day a success. I'm sure the story will pick up from there. I lower my foot, dragging the chair to a stop, and notice the cobwebs over the curtains. Ugh, how long has it been since I dusted anything around here? My new vacuum has an attachment for curtains. According to the kid who sold it to me, it has an attachment for everything. The box of hoses and brushes is as big as I am. I sort through them until I find the one for removing cobwebs from curtains. It works so well, I use it in the other rooms too, even the ones without cobwebs. Back to work. My cursor takes a steady rhythm, mocking me. How hard can this be? Pick the worst thing that can happen to your character and make it happen. So, a meteorite crashes through the roof and kills her. The end. No, that's not the worst thing. It's too easy. I spin my chair, this time in the opposite direction. Maybe that's not a dolphin up there. Maybe it's a porpoise. The cat slings up, purring and wrapping herself around the desk leg. Didn't someone feed you this morning? I'm pretty sure it was someone else's turn to feed you. I sigh and swing to my feet. The cat bolts ahead, her sagging belly swaying back and forth as she runs. Maybe you could stand to miss a meal. It might be time to give you a bath or something, too. There's still food in her dish. She just wants me to shake it around a bit. Still purring like a clogged lawnmower, she rubs against me, leaving a trail of hairs clinging to my black sweats. The vacuum has a pet attachment, too. I glance at the clock. Two hours until Greg gets home with the kids. I've got plenty of time to figure out that knock at the door. We're home! <laughs> the kids stampede up the stairs. I shut my laptop with a scowl at the blinking cursor and the last words on the page. There was a knock at the door. The kids dart around the disemboweled vacuum cleaner sprawling across the living room. My husband scratches his, scratches his head and stares at the scattered parts. Did you get a lot done, he asks. Oh yeah, I did, thanks. <laughs> his jaw's working, I know that look. He's trying to decide if he wants to ask. Before he can, the kids squeal and giggle, pointing at the half-naked cat as she darts for a safer hiding place. A door-to-door -door vacuum salesman, that has potential. 
I whipped the laptop back open, hunching behind it to muffle my words. The vacuum's clogged. <laughs> Our next reader, and the one after the one after that, and the one after the one after that, is going to be Jeff Bateman. Jeff is a retired Air Force Colonel. He teaches U.S. institutions, Utah history, and American military history at Utah State University. When he's not teaching or writing, Jeff likes to play bass, ride his Mustang, the real kind, and work in the garden. <clears throat> Jeff's work as a historian has been published in the Utah Historical Quarterly, Air Power History, and the U.S. Army War College Press. At the 2015 League of Utah Writers Conference, Jeff won eight awards for his poetry and prose. One of his poems is set to appear in the forthcoming League of Utah Writers Anthology. Jeff has authored three novels, No Peace with the Dawn, co-authored with Emily Wheeler, forthcoming from the Cedar Fort Press in the fall of 2016. Mogadishu on the Mojave and on the Death Beat, forthcoming 2017, Gray Gecko Press. Jeff. Good evening. In 2013, uh, we adopted a Mustang, a BLM Mustang named Rio. Um, Rio uh, competed in something called the 100 Day Mega Mustang Challenge to try to see how far a trainer can get a wild horse in 100 days. At the end of the 100 days, we adopted Rio. Um, this is how I envision this is a poem about Rio's transition from being a wild horse to being a member of our family. It's called Desert Mustang. To run is to live. Sage slaps at his knees, alone with the kiss of a warm desert breeze. Alert in the silent, desolate space, untouched by man, a state of grace. Competing for fodder, water, and space, too many horses for this harsh place. Hammering, chopping the dry desert air, it swoops down low, driving them where? Instinct against them, they move as one, wide-eyed panic, onward they run. Corralled, crowded, they strike out in fear, surrounded by steel, freedom so near. Flat hand to muzzle, a tentative touch, a start towards trust, it means so much. Skin, skin quivering under the path of my hand, afraid but not bolting, now part of our band. Halters and lead ropes, lariat spurs, patient progression and steady nerves. First saddle, first bridle, first weight on his back, no bucking, no kicking with each piece of tack. Hundred day champion put to the test, he proved his mettle became the best. Friend and companion, trust built two ways, alone but together the rest of our days. Sorry about that. I'm used to sitting here and enjoying Elicon West. It's like, oh shit, it's my turn. <laughs> I've got to get up here and talk. Our next reader is Dustin Earl. Dustin is a passionate fantasy writer. He graduated from Utah State University in 2008 with degrees in history, German, and Asian studies. Ever the adventure, adventurer, he's lived and taught in Switzerland, Germany, Austria, and China, and most recently Japan. When not exploring faraway realms, Dustin can often be found writing in a local cafe. <laughs> <laughs> I had a joke that went away. Um, <clears throat> playing the Asian game of Go, or simply enjoying a good sunset. Dustin. So, has anyone here ever been to Japan? How was it? Um, I didn't know where you're going to talk about. Okay, well. <laughs> I've been all over the country. Beautiful place. So I left for Japan in 2008, and I meant to be there for just one year. And I kept saying one more, and one more, and pretty soon what was supposed to be one year excursion turned into four. But this piece, entitled Five Minutes, is about one of my early experiences in Japan. So, 
With the glimpse of flowering blossoms rustling, rustling in an April breeze, or the orange beams of a sunset on wispy clouds. There are times when I catch a glimmer of beauty that stays with me forever. This is why I climb mountains. Only where earth meets sky can I truly feel free, if for only five minutes. In the summer of 2008, I arrived in Japan, fresh out of college and ready to show the world what I could do. I planned to climb Mount Fuji as a grand welcoming to the land of the rising sun. Conquering Fujisan was like conquering myself, proof that I could endure my years away from home. Unlike other mountains I climbed, Mount Fuji rises so prominently over packed cities and mountainous terrain that it dominates the skyline for more than a hundred miles. It is the subject of countless poems, photographs, and artwork, and it is the single most recognizable symbol of Japan. The best peaks offer more than just a good view. They offer an array of life, nature, and landscape. The trail up Mount Naomi in the northern Utah, in northern Utah, passes through meadows thick with wildflowers sloping into an alpine wilderness. Tiwanot in the Wyoming Tetons is not for the faint of heart, with its steep trails and dangerous cliffs rising to a pinnacle that drops a sheer 3,000 feet in the Cascade Canyon. Mount Fuji, an active volcano, offers rocks. Big rocks, small rocks, round rocks, sharp rocks, lots and lots of boring brown rocks. To be fair, though, I only climbed the upper part of Fujisan. Lush forests surround the lower half, but that isn't where most people usually start. And like most people, I began my ascent just below a tree line at the Subaru 5th Station on the Yoshida Trail. The 5th Station is a tourist trap, and with the exception of a small Shinto shrine, the hotels and shops look like a tacky alpine village. If I didn't know any better, I'd have sworn I was at a ski resort. Mount Fuji itself looms over the hotels and souvenir shops, or so I imagined, were it not for the clouds blocking the view. Fujisan is an extraordinarily shy mountain. She's so large, she has her own weather patterns and gladly snatches nearby clouds to wrap around herself like a fluffy blanket. Now, every good hike needs a walking stick. And with my favorites still back in the US, I perused the shops whose selections included a variety of staffs, each with intricately carved mountain gods or local animals. I opted for a plain four-foot wooden pole. This has since become one of my best hiking sticks. Two Japanese signs mark the trailhead on the far side of the fifth station and a line of haggard hikers returning from their ascent ambled past as I took my first steps onto the trail. They leaned on their own walking sticks, cringing with each step. I gulped and sped on. The path ahead couldn't be that difficult, could it? Lush trees and pink flowers lined the way, and the hum of cicada song punctuated the ambience. Miniature shrines dedicated to the mountain gods dotted the path, and one such statue stood winking at passers-by with a small pile of coins at its base. I couldn't decide whether his expression wished the hikers good luck or whether it was meant to encourage donation. I still had a few of American pennies in my wallet, and so I left them for him, hoping that American currency would bring as much luck as Japanese. It didn't. <laughs> the trees soon parted at the sixth station, Rokugome. From here, the land below stretched into the horizon, growing from a canopy of green. Sadly, all I saw was gray fog. The trail widened, zigzagging into the mist, so the descent begun in earnest. Most people turned back here, satisfied with their 40-minute contact with nature. I climbed into the drifting haze above, and it dampened the sound of the other hikers, leaving me isolated with my thoughts. For the first time, I contemplated what I was doing. Here I was, on the other side of the world, and climbing a mountain I'd only seen in pictures and film. The thought invigorated my muscles and drove me on. I'd worked for years to finish my degrees, 
and move out into the world. And now, at last, here I was. There's a saying in Japan, or excuse me, in China. He who does not reach the Great Wall is not a true man. The Japanese have a similar phrase. Fujisan, ichigo no noboranu, bakka. Nido, noboru, bakka. This roughly translates as, he who has never climbed Mount Fuji is a fool. And he who climbs it twice is a greater fool. <laughs> in China, I passed my test in the manhood, and now I would prove I was no fool. Still, what about climbing Mount Fuji twice made you the greater fool? The path gradually narrowed until the switchback stopped at the seventh station, Nanagome a collection of mountain huts offering lodging, overpriced food, and outrageously expensive water. Each hut also offered a special hot iron stamp for your walking stick as proof you had made it this far. For a price, of course. <laughs> I leaned on my pole and sighed as the man pressed a hot iron to my stick. I felt like such a tourist. <laughs> Nanagome, the seventh station. The word nana in Japanese means seven. But there's also another word for it, shichi. Shi has connotations with death, so while shichigome means the seventh station, in liberal interpretation, it could also mean the death station. Not a particularly pleasant thought, as I wondered why my mind focused on this obscure aspect of the Japanese vernacular. I passed hundreds of people on the trail, but it was those in their 60s, 70s, and dare I say 80s that impressed me the most. They huffed, moved slowly, but kept going. Their determination reminded me of Ulrich Intervenen, a mountain guide who had scaled the Matterhorn in the Swiss Alps 370 times, with his last, ex last ascent being at the age of 90. He had continued to climb other easier alpine peaks until the age of 95. The sky cleared. At last, I could see the top, closer than I'd anticipated. Both my legs and feet rejoiced. I already felt bruises on the bottoms of my feet, and a blister growing under my little toe didn't help. I, still s I sat on one of the benches at Nanagome and eased my shoes off, spilling out the tiny stones that had slipped in. My soles were red. It's amazing how much lava rock hurts, even through thick shoes. Here and there, patches of green dotted the browner slope, and an occasional bird darted about, snatching insects. A small cliff of rock jutted from the top, and was the only feature of note. When compared to the idol and worshiper of Mount Tiwanot, it wasn't really much to look at. Still, that was my goal, and I would meet it before sundown. The clouds stretched up and pulled back like wisp wispy fingers reaching for an endless sky. One in particular rose like a menacing shadow over the others, and for the first time, I began to question the wisdom of climbing the tallest mountain in Japan while a tropical storm hovered off the Honshu coast. <laughs> Fujishan's shadow spread over the clouds in a perfect cone. It grew, moving like a stalker through the mists as the hours waned. The higher I climbed, the more difficult it became to breathe, with each inhale harder than the last. My muscles tingled and my head spun with the beginnings of altitude sickness. Although sleeping in the huts at the top would help acclimatize, this was going to be a long, headache-filled night. A sinking pit welled in my stomach as I neared the rocky outcropping. There were ten stations on Mount Fuji, and if I was near the top, why hadn't I come across the eighth yet? I sighed. Yes, this top was the 8th station, Hachigome. I looked back at the rocky, outcrop rocky outcropping I wrongly felt to my goal. It now sat at least two or three hundred feet below. The sky brightened at the last shades of twilight, and when the slivers of pinkish sunlight faded, the moon rose like a pale lantern, illuminating distant clouds. I looked for the altitude marker, and my heart sank. I still had more than 436 meters to go. 1,400 feet! It was like climbing every step in the Empire State Building with another 400 left to spare. 
The man in the last hut looked with trepidation at the path ahead and advised me to stay there for the night since I hadn't brought a flashlight. I looked up, this time not at the false top, but the real goal. I shook my head, no. I set out to climb this mountain today and I was going to do it. I came to Japan for the experience and if I stop now, I might as well turn around and go back home. I needed to prove I could do it. If I succeeded, then perhaps I could find a place in the land of the rising sun. I held out my staff and paid the man to stamp it, proof that I had at least made it this far. He sighed and gave me a knowing look, as if I had not been the first to ignore his sound advice. I trudged on, stubborn determination carrying my steps far above Hachigome. I looked back at the line of headlamps and flashlights dotting the trail between the 7th and 8th stations. None followed past that point. I was alone on the mountain, just like I was alone in Japan. The clouds crept back so slowly that I didn't notice until they had completely obscured the moon, leaving me in darkness. The rising winds chilled my skin, and the, la and the last leg of the journey sapped my stamina. At this height, the lack of oxygen makes each step an expression of sheer will. Altitude sickness is like having the flu, your skin tingles, and your muscles lose their strength. To keep myself going, I counted my steps. One, two, three. Every time I reached 50, I'd stop to catch my breath. Again, one, two, three, 10, 20, or was that 21? My oxygen deprived mind lost itself in the simplicities of basic math. The ninth station, Hugomi, was little more than a trail marker. No hot food, no warming huts, and no one to stamp my stick. More rocks had collected inside my shoes, and the blister on my little toe was now the throbbing size of my thumbnail. My will to go on faded, and I looked back at the death station far below, and struggled to banish unpleasant thoughts of my own demise. Then the rain started. <laughs> Water pelted my face in gusts that blew, <clears throat> excuse me. Water pelted my face in gusts that blew me while I felt my way up the trail with my walking stick. The mountain winds howled, and shivering, I drew my jacket around my neck. What was I doing? Why was I here? Not just on Mount Fuji, but in Japan. I stood on the opposite side of the world, with an ocean between me and my home. I wanted independence, freedom, but I was fresh out of college. It was like I had jumped into the deep end of the pool without ever checking whether or not I could swim. One, two, three. The winds whisked my words away. Aching, soaked, and chilled, I rounded a bend and squinted to see a Tori gate. Jugome, the last station. Only two more switchbacks stood between me and a warm blanket. My knees buckled under the pressure, but gaping for breath, I carried myself up and passed through the threshold. I looked about. It was dark. I walked past the mountain shacks in confused bewilderment. I had taken too long to get there, and they closed for the night. Years ago, during a particularly cold day in Switzerland, I got caught in Ibiza, a bone-chilling winter wind common in alpine valleys. I experienced a mild case of hypothermia, where my core body temperature dropped several degrees. I spent an hour in a warm bath, but it wasn't until after a week that my body had completely recovered. My frantic knocks on the door went unheeded, and I sat, bringing my knees to my chest as I shivered and slumped against one of the buildings to huddle from the storm. The air prickled my skin, and I, <clears throat> excuse me, the air prickled my skin and blew almost as cold as I had in Switzerland. Only this time, with a chill rain. I had conquered the summit of Mount Fuji, but she wouldn't yield a victory so easily. Was this what it was like actually living out in the world? Away from sheltered college life? I was woefully unprepared for this mountain, so was I likewise unprepared to live away from home? A group of people from India who had also braved the hike arrived 30 minutes later, and we kept each other company until someone finally noticed us and opened the door. The warm perfume of kerosene rushed into my face as I stepped into the hut. My wet clothes clung, clung to my skin, and after paying the mandatory fee, I took my bed, bunked among dozens of others. 
The heavy blanket soothed my muscles, and I drifted into restless sleep. I woke to the commotion of hundreds of people. Stumbling from my bunk, tired and stiff, my clothes still wet, I glanced through the, cloud, through the crowd. Many had spent the night. Many more had climbed up after the rain subsided earlier that morning. Everywhere, people slurped bowls of silver noodles and drank green tea. I stepped outside and scowled. Clouds covered the mountain again, obscuring my view of the legendary Fuji sunrise. I walked the caldera, up from Jukome and away from the crowds. I wanted to be alone when the sun rose, even if I couldn't see it. I stared at the reddening glow, disappointed. All of that effort and no sunrise. Worse yet, the hike back down would probably be nothing but a dull, gray fog. As if an answer to my disheartened inner voice, or in reward for coming this far, Fujisan showed compassion, and she parted the vapor. Below, the clouds rolled in a sea of violet, and above, they coalesced into a ceiling of wavy red. The sky between opened into a narrow quarter that stretched into the distant horizon of shimmering gold. Rising like a red orb, the sun peeked over the blanket like a shy child gauging an audience. From the station below, people called to it, raising their hands three times and cheering in unison, Banzai! 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 For five minutes, I stared awestruck at the halo of color. For five minutes, I was free. Free of care, worry, or pain. My cramped legs became a distant moan and my headache faded into the first light of the rising sun. Fujisan gave me a moment of paradise that I'll ever thank her for. The fog soon rushed over the caldera, again obscuring the horizon and leaving me in a bright gray haze. It was enough. One of the men at the tin station, Jukome, stamped my stick with bright red kanji. Japanese characters proving that I'd made it. The stick sits in the corner of my room, and every time I look at it, the red mark serves as a reminder of Fujisan and the lessons she taught. I climb mountains for those rare moments when, in freedom offered by the high places of the world, I catch a glimpse of beauty and understand what it means to live. Though an ocean stood between me and my home, I now knew I could face what Japan offered. As long as she, from time to time, gave me five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Dustin. I love that piece. Okay, next up is, is Jeff Aitman again. And Jeff is just an awesome guy, jack of all trades, that sort of thing. I mean, this is the kind of guy who comes here 45 minutes early, sets up the chairs for his own performance. And uh, he's, that was he, 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 he's <laughs> <laughs> um, a storyteller, he is a poet, and he's a handyman, as you're about to find out. <laughs> I apologize in advance if this piece is a little too liter uh, literary for some of you. I know things about toilets. <laughs> Let's talk about our toilets, shall we? It's something we all have in common. Plus, I have some really good info to share. You want to record in that DIY book of knowledge in your head. The porcelain throne. We sit on it, occasionally kneel before it, even hang from it in dire emergency, its cold surface providing the only measure of comfort we feel at certain times. <laughs> if you've ever repaired a toilet, you've probably bent over it, laid under it, maybe even done the Kama Sutra inspired reverse sit technique when replacing the float mechanism. <laughs> if you've replaced a toilet, you've wrestled gooey wax rings and rotted washers and cleaned up stuff under the basin you shouldn't describe in polite company. If you're a classic over-tightener, you probably cracked at least one tank in Tyler you to a free trip, return trip to Lowe's. No, ma'am, I think it came like that. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet you ain't done this. After doing your business, you pull up your sweatpants, only to hear an unfortunate plop as a sharpie in your pocket falls into the bowl right after you flush. We'll call this phenomenon the sharpies. The sharpies. Don't panic. You have three milliseconds to snatch that Sharpie from the bottom of the bowl before it starts to spin. But you hesitate, cause well, ooh. <laughs> and down goes Sharpie, down goes Sharpie. 
You hope the sharp people get on vertically, but you know it won't. Sure enough, somewhere deep in the bowels, so to speak, <laughs> of your toilet space, your sharpie wedges itself sideways, but good. Multiple hopeful flushes later, culminating in the dreaded over-the-rim bathroom floor deluge, you realize wishful thinking is not going to solve this one. You break out the drain cleaning apparatus. You know, that corkscrew attached to a stiff cable with a crank at one end to make a twist in the pipe. You even have one for toilets specifically because, well, shit happens. <laughs> this is where your PhD in blockage combat comes into play, right as you get the serpentine at the bottom of the base. This is no mere sink trap. When you do, you're in the big leagues of man portable drain cleaning systems. You jink up, down, right, left, repeat until finally you feel the head of the tool clear the bottom of the toilet. You're not sure what will happen to that Sharpie next, but at least it's going to leave a toilet, right? Wrong. That Sharpie is wedged in there so tight, the tool just keeps slipping past it. You discover this with your second flush test. Help us once again in the face of an unplanned waterfall event. <laughs> you drain, disconnect, and remove the toilet entirely, determined to get that Sharpie come hell and high water. <laughs> so you jam the tool in the base again, this time from underneath, a sneak attack. You see the head of the tool emerge, just like the critter, sh critter shooting out of the barnacle creature from Alien. Success! <laughs> time for another flush test. Third time's the charm. So when you go buy your new toilet, <laughs> <laughs> may I recommend American Standard? That bad boy surges enough water into the bowl to raise a sunken ship, then sucks it down like a black hole. I don't believe the product of any natural process is capable of clogging it. I don't know about Sharpies, though. I'm no longer allowed to have them in my pockets. <laughs> is good at almost everything, including but not limited to procrastination. <laughs> Unfortunately, those skills do not appear to have lent themselves to the writing of bios or the meeting of deadlines. <laughs> Fortunately, we're in the same writing group. <laughs> and I have been able to glean from Sherry Lynn the following from her stories. Sherry Lynn was born. <laughs> <laughs> She tried her hand at soccer. <laughs> Moving on. She became a band geek in middle school, which skills she parlayed into a pretty impressive talent on the trumpet. She joined, <clears throat> excuse me, just one second. I repeat that line. <laughs> Along with her husband and partner in crime, she has totaled two vehicles, that, sorry, that three that we know about. Uh, in fact, um, she, oh, excuse me, before she finally learned to channel her violent tendencies into Shorinji Kempo Karate. <laughs> She's working on getting her black belt now, is that correct? Yep. Yeah. And violent, violent. <laughs> oh, and she writes a little too. She has a degree in creative writing. In fact, her writing has won several awards. She has a piece in an upcoming anthology. She's working on the next great Japanese-American novel. <laughs> oh, and she's married with kids and a dog. The end. Sherry Lynn. <laughs> well, this is a flash piece that I wrote in my college days. Um, it was inspired by a friend of mine who confided in me that she's worried, she was worried about believing that her dreams were reality and her reality was worse dream or dreams. And so that's kind of what this was inspired by, but it turned into something a little different. So <coughs> it's called Mirrored Realities. Sometimes I wish a bus would ram into my car. Doctor number seven's head jerked up from her paperwork. What? It's nothing. Do you feel that often? She asked, her voice measured. My eyes shifted to the window. Lavender scented air freshener filled the room to tease my insoluble heart. Have you been taking your medication? Yes. 
Are you lying? I guess back at doctor number seven's formal eyes. No, I take a pill every day. Does it stop those desires? I twisted my ring around and around my finger. Yes. If it doesn't, I can change the prescription. It's helping. When I got home, I took two pills. The silence cuddled me as I lay down and slept. Laughter dances around me in the mist. The awakening fell into my lap as I stared out the bay window. I sat on the sill which had been fashioned as a bench. Autumn chills seeped through the glass while stagnant air parched my mouth. The, side, the pressure of silence numbed my ears, mocking my soul where the laugh of a little girl once resonated. My eyes pinched shut while the conflicting senses raged a battle, hollowing out my chest. I entered the kitchen, grabbed a bottle, and jiggled four pills into my hand. While I walked back to the window, I threw them into my mouth and read the awakening until I fell asleep. Samantha runs, pressing her toes into the grass. I follow. Here, Mama! The blanket flies out for the picnic pie. In her room, I looked through the clothes. I held each tiny pink item up for a moment and laid them down in the line. What are you doing? I didn't know you were home, I said. Dust tickled my nose. John rested his hand on my shoulder. What are you doing? Remembering. I set my seventh piece on the ground. Are you stable enough for this? His voice chapped my ears. I didn't answer. Have you taken your pill today? I stood and turned away, headed to the kitchen. Maybe not. Samantha holds my hand before she runs to show me a blue rose. It sparkles in the sun. Looky, Mama! I look close. There are no thorns. Perfect. It smells good. She inhales. Yeah, like strawberries. My head lay against the back of the rocker. John spoke with Dr. Number 7 on the kitchen phone. I'm concerned about her, he whispered. I stood and entered the kitchen, picked up the bottle. Six pills. He saw me. Haven't you already had one? His rough face matched his voice. My head shook. Not today. At the top of a steep slope, a tree grew almost horizontal. Mama, watch me! Samantha walks across it and sits down. Allowing her feet to dangle, she waves them sporadically back and forth. Come sit, she calls, giggling. I sit and pretend to swing, hand in hand. The smell of leaves surrounds us. Seven pills slid down my throat. The absence of feeling would surround and caress me until John came home. But John was just a dream. Until I woke up, I wouldn't see Samantha. Her hair shines in the sun, a radiant red that I envied. It looks brown, brown indoors. I love the outside more. The wind spreads around the sound of birds chirping about the birth of spring. Mama, I found a ladybug. Her, her voice urges me to respond. How old is it? Huh? How many dots does it have? Um, her head turns to the side. I smile. I can't tell, it keeps moving. That's because we have to grant you a wish if you knew. Really? She chases it saying, buggy, wish. Someone rubbed my cheek, a soft caress that I knew. Please wake up, honey. I would wake up with Samantha. What would you have wished for if you could have count counted the dots, I asked. Easy, she snuggles up next to me. I want to do this all the time, every day. I smile, a picnic every day? Yep, she nods her head, her curls bounce. I put my arm around her, that would be nice. I fall backward and pull her with me. She giggles as we go down, lies her head on my breast and quickly falls asleep. The smell of grass fills my nose and my eyes close. Something tugs my chest, threatening to tear me away. My breath synchronizes as I rest. Oh God, no, John wailed. Save her. I feel free. Samantha's laughs swirl around me as she runs and finds more interesting things in the grass. The sun is warm, but not so warm that I feel the burn. I raise my hands slowly into the air. The outside smell of life spirals into my, lung, in, into my lungs, scattering its vitality with every beat of my heart. Dance with me, Mama, Samantha calls. I twirl around and around with the breeze. The world spins, but I don't get dizzy. The grass tickles my feet as I go faster. Samantha's laughs continue. 
causes me to smile as my mouth opens and rippling tones escape into the air and dance with us. A phantom tear brushes my cheek. Thank you. fishing in Canada off the North Shore of Vancouver Island. Flipper on crack. Should be jigging out the bottom a little, just for appearance's sake, but I don't. Broomstick pole sits stuff on the, stiff on the gunnel. Halibut fishing's like bait fishing trout, only fun after the strike, and you don't look cool doing it. It's what you do when you limit out on salmon. Not that I wasn't near complete bliss, Favorite Macanudo cigar in my mouth, sleepy sunshine after a cold Canadian morning, dead calm, flat inland sea, peace. And the smell of salt air, savor deliberately, like little tastes of a childhood on Puget Sound, dad's fishing hoodie, oysters in the raw, catching dungeness with a rake. Two bumps at the end of the broomstick, slight, tap, tap. Could be a snag. Just watch and wait. Tap, tap. I clench my cigar in my teeth. I want to keep it. But setting a hook is a two-handed deal. Dilemma. I've seen guys fish with a cigar or pipe, even tie on flies. Not me. I either go blind from the smoke, burn myself, or choke in some gross tobacco backwash. <laughs> Still, I clench the cigar until I know I'm sure I'm in a fight. Nothing subtle about hooking a halibut. Slack in, start the water, and yank to your head and hope for the best. Halibut don't run when they're hooked. Heavy is all you feel. They call the big ones doors because they look like one. Little ones chickens for perfect eating size. Something people say when they don't catch a door, like catching minnows and calling them pan-sized. <laughs> no fight in this fish on the long reel up. Is this a log? A lingcod, dark shape up through the green tinted sea, flash as the fist sees me, white as she turns over, her belly exposed, diving. White runs on like the end of an old movie reel. Broomstick smacks the gunnel hard, reel spits line, down she goes, taking all I just cranked in. My buddy Jim on autopilot, tackle in, engine up, jet clear for the fight to come, yelling, big damn fish, over and over. She stops running, reel like crazy, bring her up again. We spy her whole length before she runs. Jim jumping up and down, Jesus, big fish, big fish. Third time up, I'm smoked. Left arm so pumped I can't straighten it. Jim offers to help, but I have to hand over my man card with the pole, so I don't. I tell him I'm good, I hope she doesn't run again. The fish slips towards the surface, past where she turned before, into shallow water. Alongside now, big as the bottom of the boat. Jim looks at me. No harpoon. I'm really sorry. Look down at the prize we won't get to keep. Can't drag her without a harpoon. Can't bring her in the boat. Even a chicken is dangerous in a boat. I think about looping a line through her gills, maybe, but she's not tired now. Frothing the water, flip her on crack. Cut her loose close to the hook, she slips backwards, gone in a single kick. Sitting in stunned silence, spent, I spot my cigar floating by like a turd. <laughs> Jim's crushed, but not me, had the fight of my life, my old man in the sea. She'll lay millions of eggs, more butts to catch. That's what you say when your door gets away. I breathe deep on the ride to shore, savoring saltwater memories. Hey, just a, a fun personal story here. We're, we're in the middle of an award ceremony, right? 
And nobody knows the guy that's going to come up next has won the award for the best poem in the entire contest. And from behind me, as his name has been called and he's going up, I hear some, a, a little old lady who shall remain nameless say, I guess you have to be a little old lady. Yes, I, the irony is not lost on me. I guess you have to be a little old lady to win a poetry award in this league. <laughs> Jeremy Goyer, not a little old lady, <laughs> has a degree in film and media arts and has been involved in independent films as well as production for MTV, Discovery Channel, and Disney. He has since switched his efforts to writing after getting over the crazy notion that writing is only for people who know how to write. His writing has received multiple awards and categories including poetry, short fiction, novel chapters, and children's books. His poem, All Twisted Up, was named Best in Show at the 2015 League of Utah Writers Conference. Jeremy. Sure. All right, this poem, actually interesting, this poem, the original inspiration of this poem came when I was sitting right there, listening to Poetry at 3. So yes, there are benefits to coming to Hell Um It was a lot of fun to write this poem because it gave me a chance to examine some of the events of my adult life through the lenses of my childhood. This is all twisted up. It seemed he tied her tongue in knots by giving her a smile, and she pickled Peter's peppers like it was going out of style. But sweetly look but sweetly whispered nothings really offered them no clue of the tweedle beetle puddle paddle battle to ensue. How did that little busy bee improve his golden days while wrapping evening memories in murky twilight haze? The fault was not completely hers, I'll never say it was, despite the way she drew him in with gently smiling jaws. There had been times he asked if there are toy boats that out to space if that peck of pickled peppers may have somehow been misplaced. Yet still the ragged rascal ran around those rugged rocks, and all the pretty ponies kept their secrets like Fort Knox. It ended with a simple thing he barely thought would matter, but that bit of bitter butter really bittered Betty's batter. Her burning ears were hidden low, the diamond ring turned brass, the cat's back in the cradle in the house now made of glass. The lion to his unicorn, she stopped him where he stood. And let's just say that woodchuck had chucked all the wood he could. <laughs> At last, the toes of Moses turned out not to smell like roses, regardless of whatever either party still supposes. <laughs> now he's off to unique New York to be a man of means, and she's still selling seashells by the seashores of her dreams. Their rhyming game was at an end, a blink, and both had missed it. How a thing that seemed so simple could have ended up so twisted. Thank you. <laughs>